Professor Mosler, according to you, why would it be better to deal with the matter of unemployment, not as a matter of rights, uh, but as a damage made by the private sector against citizens? Taxation is what causes unemployment. Government taxation by design is meant to cause people to need the money so that the government can then hire them with its currency. The only reason we have unemployment is because government taxation has created more unemployed people than it wanted to hire. It's a mistake, okay? And so it's a, maybe an honest mistake. You put a tax in place and then you create a certain number of unemployed. You don't know how many that's going to be. But then they hired fewer than were created by the tax. That means that to me, the government has an obligation to correct its mistake. It either should hire the unemployed or it should lower taxes so they can go back to the private sector. So it has those two choices. May you talk us about the experience of the Bakaru, of the Franklin Frank, the Denison dollar, please. These are th three currencies that I was uh, involved in creating at American uh, universities two American universities and one in Switzerland. The one in Kansas City has been now running for about 25 years. No inflation for 25 years. It's had a zero interest rate policy, just like Japan has had for 25 years. It's been engaged in deficit spending for all 25 years, and it lets the market determine the deficit. So I'll tell you how that works. All students are taxed. They have a requirement to submit maybe 20 buckaroos every semester or they don't get their grades. There are nonprofit institutions in the community such as the hospital and uh, other uh, nonprofits that are authorized to pay students one buckaroo for every hour of community service that they do. And the students can earn as many buckaroos as they want as long as they perform one hour of community service to get each one. And as expected, the students do at least as much as they need, and most of them do some extra just to have some savings, you know, in case they need it for maybe they can't work for some reason. The students pay their buckaroo tax after they get paid by the university. The university spends first to pay the students, and then the tax gets paid. The university always spends more than it collects. It has to. How else can it be? And the university, when it spends more than it collects, that somebody has them, the students have them, and that becomes their savings. There is no unemployment. Any student can go to work at a, and do community service and earn a buckaroo anytime they want. It's an open-ended job. The question people ask is, what is the value of a buckaroo? Okay, so we interviewed the students to see if some of them were going to work and earning extra buckaroos so they could sell them to students who didn't want to work or couldn't work for buckaroos. And we discovered that this was happening and that students were paying other students five dollars for each buckaroo so they didn't have to go do the hour of community service work. Okay, so the market value of the buckaroo 25 years ago was five dollars, which was representative of one hour of student labor. We checked again about two years ago and the price for a buckaroo was twenty dollars. <laughs> but that was but it was still worth one hour of student labor. That hadn't changed. So the value of the buckaroo went from $5 to $20 versus the U.S. dollar. It was the strongest currency in the world. <laughs> and in terms of student labor, the dollar had depreciated because what used to be able to be purchased for $5 now cost $20. So why did the value stay at one hour of student labor the whole time? That's the question. Because that's what the school said you have to do to get it. The students need the buckaroo. The school has them, they dictate terms. One buckaroo for one hour of work, that sets the value. If the school had said you could earn two buckaroos in an hour, then the buckaroo would only be worth $10 today instead of 20. Yeah. And so the value of the currency is what the government tells you you have to do to get it because they've got it and you need it. And you only get true inflation when the government pays more for the same thing. It's the story of a monopoly. That's how monopoly pricing works. MMT is the only economic school of thought currently around that recognizes the source of the price level, which is the prices government pays. That's when it's telling you what you have to do to get the money from the government. So we understand the source of the price level, where it comes from, what makes it change, 
and it's the only valid understanding of inflation right now uh, in the world. So the lesson of the UMKC buckaroo is that uh, one, unemployment, uh, you know, full employment does not cause inflation. They had full employment. And zero interest rates don't cause inflation. It's only the government changing the prices it's paid that causes inflation. And deficit spending does not cause inflation if you spend at the same price, at a fixed price. Spending only causes inflation if the government pays higher and higher prices, and that's a political decision. You proposed to eliminate uh, all fiscal obligations and to replace them with a single tax. How would you, this single tax work, and uh, how would the tax returns change? Okay, so what I've uh, pointed out is that transactions taxes, like income taxes and value-added taxes, are highly regressive. They tax the people who can afford it the least, the most. They also have enormous compliance costs. Businesses have armies of accountants keeping track of all their records of all their employees, and it's all for tax purposes. Corporations scour the world to find legal headquarters uh, just for tax purposes, and all the people involved in that are doing work for tax purposes. The legal system has, you know, probably tens of thousands, maybe millions of employees involved in tax litigation me measures. The universities are filled with students learning tax law and learning accounting for tax purposes. And professors are teaching them and they have books and all kinds of expenses associated with taxes. The legislature spends untold hours and their staff spends hours and hours uh, discussing tax matters. Then you have the thousands of tax collectors and the prisons and then you have um, people with anxiety seeking medical attention all because of taxes. Economics professor, finance professor at University of Chicago I was speaking with uh, suggested it was at least 15% of GDP that was going into real tax compliance. So if we eliminate all those things that are creating all that work and replace it with work doing public services, for example, we will increase our public services by 20, 30, 40 percent. That would be public education, public health, public safety, all the other things that everybody benefits by. Okay, so that's why I don't like those taxes and I attempt to replace them with something that takes very, very little uh, in tax compliance. And that would be a real estate tax. You put a tax on all property, houses, business properties, all property would have a real estate tax. Compliance is very easy. If the house doesn't pay its tax, it gets sold. You don't even have to know who owns it. But what you must do is have a sustained full employment policy so that people don't lose their house because they're out of work. So when Italy tried to impose a property tax when there was high unemployment, to me that's almost criminal. Now you're forcing people who can't find work because of what the government did to lose their house. But if there are good paying jobs for anybody who wants to work, then it's a very equitable system. So I consider it a highly progressive proposal. Property tax combined with the full employment policy. Would the job guarantee generate a positive impact on uh, productivity, labor productivity, both on the short run, in the short run and in the long run? Uh, the short answer is yes. And the reason is uh, producti your, your real wealth as a nation is your pile of stuff that you produce. The more people working, the larger your pile of stuff. And with more people working, now there's a reason to, more reason to increase productivity because that's the only avenue to grow. Full employment policy provides the incentive for investment uh, into, in, you know, uh, investments that increase productivity. In India, uh, as you know, in India there is a job guarantee program um, uh, uh, limited to rural areas for a limited period of time, uh, a time of 100 uh, days a year. And during this pan the pandemic crisis, the uh, number of people accessing the program uh, went from 60 to 100 million 
of people. Therefore, uh, the program stabilized the jobs, the number of jobs and the economy from the recessive impact of the crisis. Now, would you accompany the uh, reddito di cittadinanza, citizenship income in Italy, with a job guarantee program? Uh, I would go with the job guarantee program first and then rather than a universal citizenship income, I would target the citizenship income to people who were not able to work or people who were disabled, you know, that, that type of thing. And then, um, but leave the current support systems in place, so, uh, which, which are numerous already. There are already lots of people getting support from the government. Leave that in place and have a job guarantee first and then take a look at how things are operating and decide if you need a citizen's income in addition to that. Because you might find you don't need it. Oh, oh, oh. Oh.